So welcome back to the Elevated Entrepreneur Podcast. I'm your host as always, Raylan Davis. Today, I have an amazing guest. If you're new to the podcast, by the way, I'm a digital entrepreneur, former MMA fighter, former athlete, all that fun stuff. But what that, why that's important to you is because I am a decoder of success. To be quite honest, the reason why I've become a six-figure entrepreneur, six-figure coach is honestly just from seeing other successful people, seeing what they do very well, breaking it down and just repeating that process and innovating along the way. And so I made it a mission of mine to bring on some of the most uh, unique strategists, the people that make me think about what I do, why I do it, and I want them to bring something to you. So without further ado, my next guest is Anthony Garcia. He is a mindset coach, but beyond anything else, he has consistency in his writing that allows people to break patterns. And that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. So everyone, please, while you're at home in your car, put your hands together, but don't crash your car and and, and welcome my good friend, Anthony Garcia. Anthony, I want to start this off with a quote Ooh, because I think I like you and I are, are similar in that we, we, we have a love for Marcus Aurelius and the Stoics and all that fun stuff. And, and I wanted to start with this idea. The quality of your life depends on the quality of your thoughts. And especially in the world today, right people are are upset about the world they live in they don't like the quality of their life they feel like you know things are not going well and with this guy this old old philosopher from way back in the day says listen basically it's your damn fault change the way you think you'll change your life i want to start us off with that what are your thoughts on that idea of that we have the power we have the 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 um, wherewithal to change our entire life simply by thinking differently. Yeah. First of all, I love Marcus Aurelius's writings because he wasn't a guy who was looking to get a book deal. You know what I mean? He didn't talk to his agent and say, listen, I'm going to put some thoughts together. You think we can scale this thing? He was yeah. literally writing to himself. It was a diary that was not meant, as best we can tell, for publication. And so like, how, how honest are you going to be if you're just writing to yourself? So first of all, the impressive quality of the fact that here's a man who was trying to organize his thoughts in such a way that would prepare him for success on a level that most of us will never see. Ruling a kingdom, ruling a kingdom at a young age, knowing you're going to be pulled in every direction. The influence that you have, your word is law, knowing that power, the temptations that come with that power, but also knowing the people are going to want to knock you off. The people are going to want to see you fall. So other than the fact that you have a position, what else is going to hold you into a place of integrity? What else is going to keep you heading in a, in a good direction without crashing into a wall like so many of the other rulers and emperors uh, that he had come after other than organizing your thoughts? And I completely agree with that line of thinking because you can see it. You can see two people encounter the exact same situation and one is in agony and one uses it as fuel to triumph one person is completely dejected and they give up and they walk away and the other person goes man this is going to make a great story one day so we know that it can't be the circumstance, right? We know it can't be the situation. Yes, there's some hardwiring. Maybe there's some nature versus nurture and somebody had a, maybe a different kind of upbringing. All that stuff could be in the mix for sure. But the one thing that separates the two is the way they think about life, the way their perception and the way they view the world, the way they view themselves is what changed the path that, that, that those two people went on. So absolutely think that's a phenomenal quote. Well, one of the reasons why, too, I wanted you on the podcast and, and why, you know, you and I, you know, I consider you not just a client, but a friend. And like I think right. the reason why I'm so drawn, drawn to you is because you help people think differently. And you started doing this thing every single day uh, on Instagram, having these daily mind shifts, as well as your email, the daily mind shift. And so I guess my first major question is like, why did you take it upon yourself to help people start to think differently? Because it, what's interesting is we are two sides of the same coin and that I made it my mission, my purpose to help people think differently from a business perspective, from you know a little bit mindset for sure, but everything from marketing, et cetera, about thinking differently. And then here you are on the opposite side of that, arguably the more important side, which is personal like thinking differently. So why did you even start this process in the first place? Because I think it's very tempting for people to live in the realm of what if. And mm. 
if this, then that. And so, listen, I would be happy if. I would feel successful when. And the ifs and the whens keep us trapped in an eternal loop that we'll never reach, right? So is it possible for someone to change their lives without the external circumstances changing in that moment? Is it possible for somebody to find increased levels of joy, contentment, well-being? Is it possible for somebody to completely change their perception of life without changing their life circumstance? And you, you can't you don't have to look too far. You, you pick up a book like Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, a, a successful educated man who gave his life essentially to science who is then uprooted placed in concentration camps watches his family stripped away from him loses his father and his mother to the concentration camps his brother and his brother's wife and then ultimately his wife to disease which you could argue is a result of what she experienced and here's a guy who can write about purpose and meaning and joy and the thing that got him to that place wasn't circumstance because he was watching people die around him every single day and he was watching that the will to live was leaving them and it was the will to live that ultimately put the final nail in the casket when they lost their will when they lost their purpose when they lost the drive to see a potential future that's when the lights went out on their physical being so I am passionate about the fact that, yes, you can and should improve the quality of your life. Get healthier, eat better, exercise, get good sleep, work towards uh, financial hygiene and improving and looking at budgeting. How can I improve or, or start a business? All those things are, are going to add to the quality of your life. But what if people realize that they could improve their lives simply by improving their thinking? And that's something that's accessible to all of us because it's very easy for people to go, man, yeah, of course you can be happy because your life stacked up this way. Of course must you can nice. find contentment. It must be nice for you because this was given to you or you were fortunate enough to be born over here. Now, that doesn't discount real things like privilege and, and the benefit of circumstance and all that stuff. But there's too many stories of people who have risen up through situations that you and I would never even want to imagine having to encounter. And they did that by improving the quality of their thinking. So I'm super passionate about helping people see that <clears throat> your perspective, not your circumstance, determines the quality of your experience, flat out. But your why you though? Like, why did you get so, because like for me, for example, because um, it, it took a while, our mutual friend, Tim, uh, we're talking about the purpose of the brand of Elevated and what we're doing. And 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 to be frank, the reason why was because I was a victim of my own life, right? Like I was a victim in terms of like, yeah, there's some things that happened as a kid, you know, my father being, you know, abusive and all that. But but there's a point where then I had choice, like I, I could choose to have a, a better life. And arguably, I realized that there's people out there that are like me that because of the way they look at the world, because of the way that they look at business or they look at the limiting beliefs and their excuses, is is that's the reason why they're not being successful. So my my purpose was like, I want to pave the way. Um, I want to clear the path, so to speak, for selfishly for the, the past me. Like, that's why I do what I do. And so that came from a personal experience. So there, was there something for you that like, I don't know, you, you had to battle with or something that you had to kind of come to terms with that was like, I'm going to clear the path for others? Well, I grew up in a very strict, kind of, you could definitely argue, fundamentalist, religious uh, background. So my community was very close-knit, and, and there was safety in the confines of the community. And, and that, I mean, it was a small community, but because of that, everybody was so uh, together, and it was, there was a bond there that you really couldn't separate unless you veered out of this particular lane and started to think and see things differently. And so I was somebody who was always curious. You know, I, I, I had received what I had been taught about life, about, you know, the nature of the universe, all of these things. But then I started to bump into other ways of thinking. I started to bump into books that weren't on the recommended reading list, if you know <laughs> what I mean, and started seeing that there's another way to view life. And then I would get out into the marketplace. And I remember getting, you know, my first couple of jobs 
bumping into people who I had always been taught uh, were horrible and crazy and they're going to steer you down a wrong path and finding them to be some of the most generous, loving people I'd ever met. And so then you're, it's kind of like you, you get pulled out of the matrix a little bit and you're yeah. presented with the two pills and you're like, well, may, maybe life is different. And so I started reading even more uh, wider and started to expand the, the influences around me. And I started to see, man, there is power in expanding your worldview. There's power in asking questions that make you uncomfortable. And I started to see some of the walls of my experience coming down. And there was there's deconstructions that happen. When you're introduced to information that is in complete contradiction to what you've always mm -hmm. known to be true, and you sit with it long enough, it starts to rattle your categories. And everything that you had kind of gone to as a safe place, as an anchor, like this is the nature of reality. When that stuff is ripped away from you, you have two options. You can completely implode and fall apart, or you can start to poke the box a little bit and say, well, where else is this a little more malleable than I thought it was? What else is possible here? Because what I was told, there's a, there's a whole other world of exploration available to me. And so I, I had always kind of been curious about that stuff. So the, the more you go into life and the, and the more you explore, you start to realize, and I think this is the fundamental shift for me. I can't point to a moment, a mm -hmm. series of experiences, when you come to realize that everything is made up. And I mean that. I mean, everything is made up. Every category, every human category, the way we divide humanity up into sections and categories and races and religions and all of the, the fundamental building blocks of society are entirely made up. That doesn't mean they're not real. They clearly have power. Mm -hmm. We, When we agree upon a certain way of living and everybody goes in that direction, there's power there. Like Think about money. Think about status. Think about relationships. All of these things are made up institutions that agreed upon have a certain level of value. But when you start to realize if everything is made up and these categories aren't working, I can change them. And when you start to shift a little bit and you see the, the influence that it has on your life, the impact that it has on your life and your relationships, it gives you freedom to explore even more. And then all of a sudden that discomfort and that fear of the unknown becomes a sandbox you want to play in. And so that has been my experience, and it's something that I'm constantly going towards. What what are different ways of thinking that I haven't even explored before? And so I think curiosity has been the through line there. It hasn't been specific situations. It's more just about a series of bumping into different things to explore. So, so like for you, was a part of it like, you know, in the in in the religious like confines you were like yeah but like there's so much other stuff over here and then i think something you mentioned there was so interesting because i had the same experience like i grew up in a, in a baptist church and my father was like or not my father my my uncle was a pastor and w grew up in the church and i remember thinking even then like oh wait there's other people out here that are not going to church every day like you that are like cool like yeah, they're super sweet exactly. and arguably the people that i was going to church with were like like I remember one, not my uncle, but another pastor. His name was uh, God, pa Pastor Good. Of course. And he was the most was stereotypical pastor, uh, in that he had a Benz, he right. had gold chains, he had like these hu these nice rings, and every single Sunday, and Anthony, it was this huge talk about how we're gonna have to close the church because nobody's donating enough, no one's no one's giving enough, right? And so, but so you know, you see that even as a kid, I'm like. This does. I don't know why this is wrong, but this some don't make any sense here. Uh, yep. And then you meet other people that, again, like I said, never go to church a day in their life, and they they seem to be doing good in the world, right? And so you start yep. to get curious. And so I think for you, like again, was it just like the boundaries? Like you just wanted to push the boundaries and go, what else is out there, or or, or what was it? Yeah, it's 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 about like what else is possible if if you've been told. Uh, have you ever seen what's that movie that M Night Shyamalan movie, The Village? Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you haven't seen it, this is a spoiler. But the movie's like a hundred years Bro, old. So there's no spoiler. Let's that move movie. on, right? <laughs> there's this tight knit community in this village, and there's constant warnings about don't go into the woods because these creatures will destroy you, right? And so they, it worked for a certain period of time until you got some curious people in the mix. 
And so you go through this storyline and the danger that lurks out there in the forest turns out to have been the the townspeople themselves trying to protect what's going on on the inside. They feel like they had a good thing going. They built a community that was meant to be separate to benefit them. Like this, let's pull away from this scary dark world and make a, a little haven, a safe place. But in trying to do that and in wrapping your arms so tightly around this community, you end up becoming the very monster that you are trying to escape. And so now you've got these people patrolling the woods to scare everybody into conformity. And toward, at the end of the film, you realize not only isn't this set in like, you know, the 1800s, it's modern and there's a city right outside these woods. And, and it's this mind blowing M. Night Shyamalan plot twist. And you go, oh, my God. And that is the reality that most of us are in. We are given this collection of beliefs, well-intentioned or not in some cases. And it helps us. It's a framework for us to get up on our feet as kids, right? And this is school, right? Let's be honest. The, the instant, I don't know if we were planning on going on this rabbit trail, but let's go here. School as we know it was literally designed on the factory system. Mm -hmm. The reason school is so cookie cutter is because that is how it is by design. At one point, there were no such thing as child labor laws. That wasn't a thing. So you could have a 30-year-old man working next to a 9-year-old boy on the line. And at some point, they started to see oh, there's these adults out here who don't have work. And there's these kids in here who are taking these jobs. So what if we put them into an institution that could give them the basic knowledge and skills to then bring them back into the workforce later? So it's an assembly line, and then we just shove. So school, we don't stop to question things like school because we've done it for so long, and how we do school, and why we do school, and this, you know, this, you know, standardized testing, and we need people to check this certain box so that we can move them along. And then you get out of school, and you ask the question like, "What did I, what did I do all this for?" Right? Yeah. Because school as an institution was made up and it served the purpose that it needed to serve in that moment. But now as a society, we're grappling with the question, is it still working for us? That's why so many people are abandoning the idea of college because there's different ways of doing life. And so for me, it's just been bumping into these different walls and realizing, wait a minute, this is actually a door <laughs> opening it up and going, man, there's a whole nother world out here. There's a whole nother thing that we haven't explored before. Let's let's see what's going on. And it's scary. It's uncomfortable. But the more you do it, it becomes it becomes a game. It becomes exciting. Like what else haven't we explored? What conversations should we start having that we have been avoiding for so long? And I don't know. I think it's just this curiosity that has caused me to ask these questions. And you start to realize that the way you think about your life the way you think about reality determines how you experience it. In, in a very real way, we are all projecting our own reality by our thoughts. We're all experiencing the same reality, but we're experiencing it completely different. So why is that person happy over there? Why is that person able to have contentment while this person over here is miserable? And you start to ask questions around the way they view the world and you start to go, okay, Okay, so maybe if I change my thoughts, or at least the thoughts I dwell on, I change my life. And that's been my experience, and that's what I'm super passionate about. No, well, obviously, it's something, too, that is incredibly needed, especially today. Because, again, everyone's circumstances are different, and everyone grows up differently. But at some point, then you do have choice. And, you know, if you're on this planet, why not get curious about – I think the way that I always kind of explain it is like – the way that you think has gotten you here. If you're unhappy, you can change the way you can change it all. Like, right. why not look at it differently? Like, especially again, to go back to like business. And I know that there's people that I, you know, I've talked to in the past and they go, well, this is the way that I've done it. And it's got me here. And I go, well, what about this over here? What if that could take you? And they're like, no, 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 I don't know about that. I'm like, well, how do you know? Right? Like clearly try something different. Right? Like, yeah. and I remember uh, there's a client, a former client that I had, who um, it, he wasn't making money, not because of his systems or his processes, although it's very little has something to do with it. It was a mental block. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sell. I don't want to do this because I, I don't like the way that this person did that. And I was like, 
is that thought, and this is something that you go over a lot, which is like, is that thought process serving you? Because it's not. And you have a choice. You can hold on to it if you want. Like, And I think there's something that I've kind of realized that everything serves you. It just may not serve you the way that you want it to. Right? Like our limiting beliefs do serve us. It serves a purpose. It protects us. It protects our ego. It allows us to stay safe. But it's like you have that or you have uncomfortable, all this other stuff, but also like another option. You can right. pick that one too, right? Like, and so what's interesting again about you and why I love your work is because again, it helps people shift. Now, I, I, I speaking of business, I want to talk about um, why you decided to try to like be a full time coach. So right now, like, there's a lot of people that are in your position right now. They have a nine to five. They have this purpose, this passion, and they're like, not only can I help people, but I can monetize it. At what point for you was it like? I know this is something that you've been doing kind of, I wouldn't say on or on and off, but like, I would, is it fair to say you weren't taking it seriously until probably the last, like, I don't know, six months or something like that, that you were like, yeah. no, I'm doing this thing. So what yeah. was the shift for you that was like, fuck it, like, I'm just going to go after it? Well, I definitely, you know, I was definitely dealing with like just some flat out limiting beliefs, like around qualifications and, and what makes you feel qualified to do these things. There are some realms, there's some hats that I've worn through experience that I, at some point you get to the place where you feel qualified. And again, it's made up, right? For instance, mm -hmm. somebody saying I'm the CEO of a company, that is a, that's a, somebody made up that position. So that, <laughs> yeah. like that's totally invented, right? And, and if enough people believe it, and if enough people see your name on the door, there you go, you're the CEO. So I was definitely what did Elon, count... Elon now calls himself something at Tesla. It's like head of tech now or like something it's... crazy. And yeah. It, he was it, like, cause he's like, I don't like, I don't care about the title. He's like, I'm the techno guy now. And <laughs> that's his exactly. official title at Tesla. And and that's who he is because he uh, decided that's who his, he is. And so for me, his chief financial officer is the, is, um, head of coin. That's, he was just like, none of these matter anyway. <laughs> So he's he's making a joke out of it, which yeah. is helpful because it helps us see that these categories aren't really they're, they're just made up. So for me, it was like, well, at first, there's the cringe factor, right, of so many people calling themselves a coach because they read a book on vacation and they were like, <laughs> maybe I should I could do that. And you're like, yeah. you see them and you see the, the quality of what they're doing and, and the influence that they're actually having. I've talked to so many people before I decided to step into that lane, who are like, yeah, a friend of mine just decided they're gonna do a, like start doing these retreats and then all of a sudden they're a life coach and I know them, like they get hammered drunk on the weekend, like blackout yeah. drunk, but they're charging people out the ear to pay for these two day retreats that are supposed to change their lives. And so you hear enough of that stuff and you, you go, man, there's the cringe factor of, I don't want to be associated with the snake oil sales people. I, I don't want to be in that lane. And then also, if I'm going to stand in this lane, I want to be qualified to do so. And then, you know, you start doing it enough in your everyday life. And in my case, you start having these conversations. You start seeing what you would do with a client you're doing it with friends, you're doing it with coworkers, you're doing it with people that you have some brief interaction with and you see them go, man, like I've never thought of things that way or that that, that totally changes though. And you see the light bulb go off in yeah. people and then you, at some point, for me, it's just like, okay, why am I holding myself back? Who am I waiting to knight me official qualified coach? Mm -hmm. And then you see, again, this proliferation of, Every random person on the internet's creating this this program that will make you a certified such and such in six weeks if you pay you know a certain amount of money and you're like okay, this is made up. That certification is totally made up. Some are more credible. Don't get me yeah. wrong. Like some of there's you know there's definitely qualifications, but I'm just like this is what I'm passionate about anyways. This is what I'm trying to do in my everyday life. I love to see someone's shift. You, you can see it in somebody's eyes. You can see it. You can hear the, the change in somebody's voice when you're having a conversation and they have an epiphany moment. And, and the cool thing I love is insight. 
That for me, that's the most powerful thing because insight. That word insight, if you think about it, break it apart. Insight. It's it's this internal shift that happens in somebody and and they start to see their own power and they start to realize that they've had access to these truths their entire lives and something clicked inside of them and now once you see it you can't unsee it once once you know the the veil has been ripped off you can't see life the way you once did and you have enough of those conversations and you start to go man what if i could do this every day for the rest of my life what if I could help people come to these conclusions and not only not conclusions, but how, how can I help people have this epiphany that they think is so substantial and, and you realize that that's just one epiphany of a thousand other epiphanies they're going to bump into as they continue this kind of work and these kinds of thought explorations. And so I just decided, fuck it, man. Why am I holding myself back? Who am I waiting to give me permission? Mm. Let's just go. Now, and, and so many people, and the reason why I even asked you that was because so many people right now, and it's funny you mentioned like the aha moment, but it's also like the, can I give them insight? Can I give them, you know, not even the conclusion, but I get, can I get them on the journey? And a while ago, I made the mistakes. I've been in it for a little bit now, um, which is funny because it's like, I've been doing this for two and a half years, three years. And in the digital world, it's like 10 like most right. people give yeah. up after like the first six months or a year. Exactly. And yeah. um, the one thing that, you know, I decided recently when we started Elevated was two things. One, I knew there's people out like you out there that could really make a difference, but just needed, you know, the, the community, the accountability, the, the, the guidance to be able to do it. And I, I, you know, you know how everyone has those like ridiculous fucking, you know, vision statements where like, I want to help a million people. And shit like that was my vision for a while right like i want to help a million people and then yeah. you know I, you know i'm not saying that it's not the goal anymore but now it's like i can't do it by myself but i know that there's people like you out there that i could help start going down that path and and one of the things i realized was that when you, there's a moment and i think you'll learn this especially the more and more clients you get is that i made the mistake and this is for you and everybody that's listening of going if they don't hit this level by this time i'm not a good coach and I would put all of my energy into like valuing how good I am based on their results. Cause that's what everyone tells you to do. If your clients right. aren't getting results, you're a shit coach. But also there's so many factors that go into it on top of the fact that time is not real. Like it's like, right. I didn't get to on my own six figures for until like a year in yeah. like, Oh, I say it until, but like, that's actually pretty good in this space. Yeah. That's, it doesn't suck. Yeah, yeah it, it's, you know, whatever. But still, like, it took me a while to have things click, and I still don't have it all figured out, right? But my goal, I realized, is not to help, you know, that's why we changed, like, even elevated from, you know, helping people become six-figure, whatever. It was like, now, I just want to help people get to 5K a month. Let's yeah. get there. And the reason yeah. why is because I realized my, my intention, and I think this is a lot like you, Anthony, is that I just want you, I want to show you the door, but it's up to you to walk through it. Like mm -hmm. that's now my new intention. It's not to like yeah. literally take you on this long journey to all the way to wherever. It's like, no, I'm going to get you to the door. And then it's yeah. up to you to open. If you never open it, it's not, it's not my problem. My intention is to show you the door. And um, one of the things that I also want to talk about with you, because it separates you from everybody else, is that you are incredibly consistent with behaviors. Like one of the things that I'm trying hard which is difficult, dude, because as you mentioned, like there's tons of coaches out there being like six figure this 10 K months, do this, make eight billion dollars today. And then here I am saying literally our motto is like, do the work, do it well, and then let go. Like that's our thing. Like it's like literally work your ass off, uh, work smart, right? Uh, and find your thing. And by the way, like I don't have a blueprint for you because everyone's going to be different and it's going to take us a while to figure it out. Like I have the most unsexy community in the world because I'm like, literally, <laughs> I'm not going to give you my blueprint because I learned the lesson, man. I gave people my blueprint, but here's the truth to get me to where I am. I literally used to just cold DM people, get them on a sales call and sell them. And I worked yep. my ass, but there's a whole other world that there's way easier. And as I learn, I'm like, you're not going to, you don't need my blueprint. Like you need your own. And so. Talk to me a little bit about the daily mind shift. Cause you started that well before you and I started working together. 
which yeah. is the daily email every fucking day, which is crazy because yeah. most people can't even fucking post on Instagram every day. <laughs> like they can't even like do it in their stories every day. But here you are every single morning putting out an email that literally shifts the way people think. And you do it consistently every single day. Like, how did you even start that? What's your maybe even what's your process? Like, how do you how did you get to the point where you're that consistent? Because honestly, that is the silver bullet to business is can I do something every damn day, regardless of when when we first started working together and then I'll shut the hell up. But you were doing that with like less than 100 subscribers. Like at one point, dude, you had like what, like 10 people on the list and you still every day were doing it. So, yeah. And and to me, honestly, like to get into my to dip the toe into my backstory I wasn't the most disciplined as a kid, right? When when it was Saturday work day, my brother was out schlepping stuff in the lawn. I was hiding, reading comic books. I was trying to dodge and duck any kind of responsibility, homework and studying for tests and all that stuff. I just didn't, I, I lacked the discipline, right? And so I have been passionate and voracious in reading and in learning my entire life. But the structure of showing up consistently was lacking. And I've been writing for, for a number of years. I've started a couple of blogs. And, and what you do is you go, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to post, uh, maybe I'll do three times a week. And then you write a post and you feel good about it. You upload it. And you whether you get good response or it's crickets, you go, okay, okay, you know what, three times a week. And then you get busy, you stay up too late, you whatever. And it's like, okay, well, one is okay. Like, I know I said three, but let's just do one. At least I did something. And there's that like hit of dopamine that like you thought about trying. And so that satiates you for a little bit. And then I would flake out and I would just not post and I would just eventually bail. And and throughout this process, you get people who read and go, man, that's really powerful. And then you get these questions of like, Hey, you remember that thing you used to do? Like, why did you stop? And I wouldn't have a good, I wouldn't have a good reason. Well, you know, life gets busy and it's all bullshit excuses, right? And then I started to say, listen, if this is really what I want to do with my life, if this is how I really want to add value, it's going to have to be a practice. And this was the, the approach, the daily email. First of all, I think of somebody like Seth Godin. And if you're listening to this and you don't know who Seth Godin is, you need to. It's business, marketing, genius, all around good human being, great thought leader, somebody who, and here's what Seth's been doing for, I think he's probably up at like 8,000 emails daily. He's been writing and shipping daily emails for over a decade Mm -hmm. and consistently and i'm somebody who's a subscriber and i followed seth's work for so many years and every morning when i open my email there's seth godin and he shows up and he's done the work and he's influenced me for years and i've always said man i would like to get there and it's always that someday or when and eventually i just said and it's been well over a year and a half now i said you know what and and i was thinking it was december i remember i got the idea what if i did a daily newsletter around just perception and perspective and mindset and i was like okay cool it's coming up on the new year why don't you start january 1st Mm -hmm. and i then there was that other voice in my head that said mother you you know you're not starting if you (laughs) so i was like dude forget it tomorrow so i threw together a, a sub stack i made a logo put together an about page and i shipped the first thing the middle of the month in december and i haven't looked back and it's at at first it was a hurdle, man. You're like, what do you write about today? You just wrote three days in a row. What are you gonna write about? But here's what happens when you show up. It's it's that Stephen Pressfield idea of the resistance. Whether you feel like it or you don't, you put your ass in a chair and you show up and you add value. And whether you've got one person reading it this morning and that person's your significant other or your grandma who loves you, or it's a thousand people who are reading it and sharing it, you are showing up first and foremost because you said you would. And that has been the shift for me. It's, this is my practice. Yes, I hope it's adding value to people who read it. I hope it's helping people. But regardless of who reads it today, 
And at, at one point, I was following the metrics every day. I'm like, okay, who read it today? But I yeah. don't do that. Very, very rarely do I do that anymore because that's not why I do it. Yes, I do it to serve. Yes, I do it to add value. Yes, I want it to shift someone's perspective and therefore change their life. But whether or not that happens today, I did what I said I was going to do. And you start to put those reps in. And now it's it's a part. It's like you're telling me it's time to brush my teeth. Of course I'm going to do that. That's what I do every day. And I do it consistently, and it's not a question mark anymore. My kids know it. My wife knows it. doesn't matter what we're doing. doesn't matter what time I get to sit down and do it. This is my commitment. And for me, there's something incredibly, if you're watching this or listening to this, there's something incredibly powerful about a practice. If you see this ad, like if you're thinking about starting something, if you're thinking about it's a podcast, it's a newsletter, it's you're going to start posting on TikTok, you're you got whatever it is you're thinking about doing, if your first thought is how can I quickly monetize this and get make it blow up, you're probably going to crash into the wall. But if you say I'm going to use this as a public forum for practice, it will shift your mindset and it'll shift how you show up. And here's why I've made a commitment to myself, but I've also made a commitment to your inbox. I promised I was going to show up in your inbox every morning. What happens if I stop doing that? What happens if I break that promise? What does that say about me? What does that say about who I am? And, and you break your promise enough to people, people stop showing up. So for me, the power behind it is the practice of daily showing up and and if you're somebody who's watching this and you're thinking about content creation or you're thinking about um writing and you're struggling like man what about writer's block and what if i run out of ideas you don't get a chance to run out of ideas if you said you were going to show up every day you you will bang your head against the wall and an idea will pop you will show up and and obviously you don't want to just throw random stuff out there just because just to say you checked the box and did it but when you start to build this practice, it completely revolutionizes the way you think. It changes because now insights are coming to you in ways that they hadn't before because now yeah. you're open and you're looking. Now I'm looking say, around. Like, the way that I looked at it, like, and because again, I have to thank you because you inspired me. I started a new practice uh, a little less than a week ago where I said, I'm going to make a Twitter thread every single day. And nice. what I found is even really early on, again, I'm only like a week in. But I started to get really good at um, writing. I've, all, I've never been I've never been one to ever say that I'm a good writer. And it started, yeah. we talk about stories to tell ourselves. Well, as a kid growing up, I had teachers that were just like, literally like, you suck at writing. Like, this is not your thing. Like, you need to just go and keep talking. Like, it's not your Can thing. Can you bounce a basketball? Okay, uh, cool. Let's yeah, see. like, they were like, oh, like, you know, for me, it was like, hey, you're really good at, like, shooting double legs and dropping people on their head, but writing's not your thing. <laughs> And um, <clears throat> there was there was one teacher though shot to Miss Abraham man so uh, I, there was a teacher I had Miss Abraham that can, that started the process of unlocking um, what now I fall into which is like I actually like writing and it was because I was writing I was really really frustrated one day and I go to her class and <clears throat> we had to do some essay and I'm like I'm just really frustrated and she was like well why and this by the way like this was like ninth or tenth grade and I was like I'm just frustrated because I have shit I want to say, but I can't say it. Like, it won't come out. She's like, well, what's the problem? Like, is it writer block? Like, what's going on? And I go, I, do, I don't have the fucking words. And, yeah. she, and she was like, well, just say that. And I said, say what? Like, I can't swear. She goes, first of all, I'm your teacher. And she goes, Raylan, there are no such thing as bad words. Mm. This, it's What is different, though, is the effectiveness of those words. So, wow. obviously, if you fill the page with F words, like, you know, it maybe it's not as effective. But if you're struggling and the first word out of your heart is fuck, write fuck. And again, this is my 10th grade teacher. And I was like, what? I could do that? And then all of a sudden, writing became easier because was, I was writing for me. So anyway, my point is when, like, when you let go of that resistance and just create to create, I find now with me doing Twitter posts, I thought the same thing. I was like, I'm going to run out of shit to write about. Now, if you put a camera in front of me, I can just go off for days, as you know. But the yeah. writing, for some reason, but what I found, to your point, was the more I wrote, the more I started seeing. And then I, the more I started seeing, I, now I have these notes where it was just like one word things and, and these kind of things. And now I'm starting to appreciate the value, for example, of like com. I've always been obsessed with comics. 
But like now I'm, I'm like, oh, I get why they say you have to write every single day. Now yeah. I understand like the benefit for me is not like growing on Twitter. That would be a byproduct. I'm doing it, which is what you're referring to is I'm doing it to improve on the skill set and I'm doing it for me. Yeah. And the cool part is, again, even writing on Twitter has improved my content, my video content. Because now I think in terms of, oh, I realize when I speak, especially like my reels or short form content, I have a lot of buffer in there. It's making mm. me be more concise with my words. It's making me form like, because the other part of it too is like, if you do, uh, especially email, uh, Twitter threads, blogs, the most important thing is not the content uh, of that blog or Twitter post. It's the hook. And so now I'm like getting better at like writing hooks. I can say hooks, but writing for some. So the cool thing is about what you do and why, I, again, you inspired me to start was because I was afraid of it. I was like, yeah. writing is not my fucking thing. I'm not good at it. I'm not good at it. No one's going to read this shit. And then I started doing it. And then now it's like, oh, like there's so many other benefits to it that I didn't even notice before. Yeah. And, and just for somebody who's like, man, that's cool, but I'm not a writer. Like, first of all, yes, you are. Right. Like you can pose text messages, DMs, uh, emails. You, you, you are a writer. And here's the thing about writing. Like if you're driving down the road and you get a random idea and you pull out your phone and do a voice to text or, you know, you just record your voice of a thought that comes to mind. That's writing. And if you think about somebody who's writing a song, what do they do? think about that? Writing a song. They're, they get a melody and they go, wait a minute, I could, hmm, and they're humming it and then, okay, and they track that and then all of a sudden words come. And so they're going through life. They're in the shower. They're at a restaurant. They're, they read some random line in a book or something in a movie catches it and they go, wow, that's a good idea. That is writing. So first of all, you are a writer. The question is, what do I need to do to make my writing um, cohesive? What do I do? Like you're saying that, how do I connect someone to a story? How do I <clears throat> help somebody see a through line to, to complete a thought? Right. And the cool thing about writing for you as a person, as a practice is you write to know what you think mm -hmm. when you write, it crystallizes your thoughts in a way. And you know, if you're saying bullshit when it hits the page or the screen, whatever it is, like mm -hmm. you write it down and you go, I don't believe that. Or you write it down and go, huh, and you sit back and you play with it a little bit more. And the first draft or the first expression of your thought might not be great. It might be horrible, but you come back to it later and you go, there's something in here. And so th the best way, if you're somebody who's thinking about, you know, thought leadership or content creation or becoming known for a, a certain line of thinking, one of the best ways to practice that out and tease that out of yourself is to write. Because now when when the words aren't swirling around up in your head with a bunch of other thoughts, they're down on the page and you can focus on them. It helps you to really lean into it and go, is this what I think? Is this true? Is this helpful? There's so many things other than just the writing and, and who reads it that is beneficial about writing as a practice. That's why journaling has become as popular as it is. It's not because there's a bunch of people who want to become professional writers. It's because there's something powerful about the act of writing. I'm looking for a book. I have one of the, uh, I'll try to find it. Julia Cameron uh, heard stuff on writing of just just building a daily morning page practice. If she, she says, get a, get lined paper and write two to three pages. The first thing you do when you wake up, just whatever thoughts to your teacher, Mrs. Abraham, the fuck is the first thing that comes into mind. You write that on the page and you just fill this line paper, three pages top to bottom with whatever comes. And as it comes, it just is a practice. I'm not gonna show anybody this. I'm not gonna give this to anyone. This isn't gonna see the light of day. Hell, I might not even look back on this one day. I, I might fill this entire notebook and then throw it in the fire. But the act of getting it out, there's something, there's a release, there's a there's catharsis that happens. And she says to do this first thing in the morning because you're getting out your fears, your doubts, all the slog, the dreams, the leftovers from yesterday, and you're clearing the way for better and for, for the work that you actually want to do. Yeah. And the cool thing about this is you would be surprised the number of artists 
not writers necessarily, but mm. artists, actors, musicians, directors, filmmakers, thought leaders have sworn by this process. It's the most simple thing in the world. You don't need to take a course for it. You don't need to spend hundreds of dollars to figure out how to do it. Just the act of showing up on the page every single day, there's so much to it. So I'm, I'm excited that you're doing it, man, because it's definitely an Again, awesome the other, thing. Like the really cool thing is, there's a, there's a, like you said, there's an honesty to it. Like yep. I wrote something last night because I just, you know, I was just, I, like, I, you know, I needed to write. So I was like, I'm going to write something. And then I, I came up with the hook first, which was um, how a fake pair of blue like gla glasses gave me all my confidence. And I had never wrote anything like that before. And uh, the reason why it was interesting to me was that I had never talked about how when I first started in digital entrepreneurship, if you go way back on my Instagram, there's a bunch of videos and podcast appearances like on YouTube that I've done where I'm wearing glasses. They're not real glasses. They're blue light glasses. And it came from the fact that like, I, many people won't believe it today, but I wasn't very confident in myself. Like you, I was struggling with imposter syndrome. Who am I to tell people what to do, how to live their life, et cetera, et cetera. And then I read this book uh, by Todd Herman called um, The Alter Ego Effect. And he talked about like how Beyonce had Sasha Fierce and, and how even uh, uh, Bo Jackson had, you know, Bo, like this different yeah. kind of entity. And he talked about totems, like these physical things that when you, if you're having a trouble to create a quote unquote alter ego, sometimes totems help because then you put them on, you're like, I am this person now. And actually the glasses is what created my account and why it's called Raylan Leads. It was, a, it was my oh, alter okay. ego. And because I was like, this person's a leader. This Raylan is a leader. I'm not a leader, but this, but when I wear these glasses and then over time, I did I realized I didn't need the glasses anymore, which is actually why here uh, soon I'll be changing Raylan leads and everything that's Raylan leads is just Raylan Davis. But again, yeah. I had never told anybody that like I just was doing it and nobody ever asked me about it. So I just I kept doing it. These just fake ass blue light glasses. But again, it's that honesty. I was alone with my thoughts and I got to just express it. And I think I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and he was talking about how he wanted to uh, uh, get rid of like uh, digital stuff. He was like, I'm consuming too much. I'm on podcasts. I'm on, you know, uh, audio books right in the morning. Like I need to take a detox. I'm like, yes, all day for sure. But also though, consider this, like I don't listen to audio books right in the morning. I only read. Because there's stillness there. There's still yep. quiet and it's just me and my thoughts. And then I write. So I look at it like a balance, like a, like a uh, equation. I'm balancing the equation. If I have constant, constant stuff going in my head for me, it just sits up there. And then I get like frustrated. I get like, there's too much stimulus. But with yeah. me writing every day now, I get some of it out. And I find myself clearing the room for more information. Does that make any sense to you? Makes total sense. And, and think about, too, what you said about the difference between, you know, like somebody would listen to this and go, well, wait a minute, what's the difference between listening to an audiobook and reading? You control the pace. You're not, somebody else isn't dictating where you're going with this line of thinking. You could marinate on a paragraph for 20 minutes if that's what you want to do. If for whatever reason that morning, that section you're reading jumps out at you in a way that you want to rest in that's the benefit of a book right the the tactile nature of it first of all just the way that you're handling it the fact that you could draw and write in notes in the margins there's there's such a benefit to that uh, mentally and you can't marinate on that in an audiobook what are you going to hit rewind for 30 seconds and listen to it five times no you're going to keep going with the pace and, you're and there's somebody else thread. telling you what to think exactly versus Whereas, like it's just my who's the narrator yeah who's the narrator when you're reading a book you're reading it so you're yeah. hearing your own voice tell you these things there's power in that and listen i'm not discounting in fact one of the most effective ways to quickly learn a concept or something that you want to gather from a book is to listen to the audiobook and read, and read it, yeah. the physical book simultaneously. But if you want to really get into a time of reflection, right, and that's the best it's suited in the morning, I would say, yeah, just reading it yourself, you're going at your own pace, you're hearing the thoughts that somebody else is communicating to you through your own voice. And, and what better to find insight when you're hearing yourself share a truth that is powerful and impactful. So, no, I think that's brilliant. So um, I wanted to get into, because obviously you have multiple, like a multitude of skills. Again, you're, you're kind of a unicorn. 
uh, and that you're really good at speaking. Again, you, people can see this on your Instagram, obviously. Like you do the daily mind shifts even on, on Instagram now. Are you doing daily or two times a day now? Twice a day. Twice yeah. a day like a beast now. Yeah. Uh, great job doing that. Uh, and then obviously you're doing the daily mind shifts in the email. And so I wanted to bring this up to you because I know you, you started with Medium a little bit. Um, you were talking earlier before we hit the record button about why you stopped. So why? Because many people, look, man, like many people start some shit and then they stop, right? That's yeah. the number one reason. <laughs> Honestly, like when I started, I mentioned earlier, right? When I started, there was people, entrepreneurs that, you know, I started with or we started around the same time that you go to the Instagram page today and they haven't posted in like a year. And you're like, well, that person gave up. I haven't seen so-and-so in a while. That person gave up. So like, First of all, why did you stop? And then after that, I'm going to tell you your new strategy because you're about to start back up. So to go back to what I had said earlier about the kind of haphazard, sporadic writing practice. So I had been writing some stuff and posting it in my own channels or even I would write pieces. At one point, I was doing like treating Facebook like my own personal blog. And I would write mm -hmm. these long form articles and post them on Facebook and because I liked the immediate response and feedback with people in the comments. So I started taking all this stuff and I and I opened a Medium account because I, I would read, you know, Medium articles quite a bit. And what so I what year was this, them, by the way? Dude, probably, I probably got on Medium 2019, okay. 2018, 2018 maybe. Anyhow, um, time is flying so fast. Thanks, COVID. But anyhow, um, so... I would just randomly post. It'd be like one random Tuesday at 10 a.m. I would throw something up and then I would not do anything with it. Come back and see if it got any engagement, any claps or whatever. And when you're first starting out in a platform where people are showing up significantly in meaningful ways, you're going to be at the bottom of the pile. And, and But I was just like, yeah, whatever. So I would get maybe it was just discouragement or like, why am I? And at this point, to go back to what I had said earlier, I hadn't built a daily consistent writing practice. It wasn't up, it wasn't on my radar. It wasn't something I was doing consistently every day and shipping writing every single day. So, you know, you just do that thing where you do it for a little bit and see what works, see what feels good. You get, you allow yourself to say life gets busy. And then I just got out of the habit, stopped posting. And then randomly every now and again, I would come back and post longer form things and and then just ghost the platform altogether. And to be honest with you, I opened Medium today because my email told me, you're, what did it say? You're gaining a following. And I looked and Raylan Davis is following me on Medium. So I'm like, oh, okay. So that brought me back to this platform that I had essentially ghosted for God knows how long. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, man, I just, I found my home on Substack and, and have been writing from there. And I just... Medium fell off my radar, and yeah. I well, it's about to be back on your ra radar. So, <laughs> yeah, first of all, like shout out once again to my buddy Shane because him and I had this great conversation. Like, listen, uh, you know, um, I think it's really important that, and I here's the other thing too. Like, the reason why I started this podcast, Anthony, I don't even know if you know this, is that I realized I was teaching and coaching so much that I wasn't listening enough. Like, oh, wow. and so the reason I started doing this podcast was because like I had you know one of you know one of our clients, Doug, on uh, last week. And I just love, like, I. the reason why I even got here was because I was a decoder of success. You can't continue to be a decoder of success. You don't fucking listen, right? Right. And I say all that, and now I'm about to talk. So <laughs> here's the oh, – yeah. so, Drop but, it. So anyway, I was talking to my buddy Shane the other night, and I finally – the very few times that I shut up and listen, he schooled me on some stuff. So he's a brilliant, like, marketer. And I think one of the things – we're actually be building content around this because the problem with people are they go, Instagram is the only way or – Tech talks the only way or whatever platform is the only way to make money. And what I'm obsessed with are the people of the world, the seven figure entrepreneurs, the people that I read all their books. They are not online like that, but still make seven figures. Right. Here you are thinking you're going to make seven figures because you have an Instagram account. And right, so yeah. I'm always looking, okay, is there another way to leverage the other platforms? And so anyway, I was talking to my buddy uh, Shane last night and he was like, Raylan, I see you're really strong on YouTube right now. You really need to start. Uh, writing because like, you're doing Twitter now because I told him about the Twitter th th uh, thread thing because I'm really excited about it. I'm really proud of myself for doing something like that. Sure. And he goes, you need to be on Medium. And I was like, okay, you know, tell me about it, whatever. And so the first thing is, here's the strategy for the Twitter that I'm going to be start doing now because I've been doing it wrong. So what I've been doing is 
Twitter or thread, and then the last thread promotes YouTube video, which is similar. And he goes, it would be more effective if you instead you you do like let's say forty to fifty percent of the content on Twitter, and then you promote the blog or the um, you know the medium article story they call it. And which makes total sense, right? Because if you're reading Twitter, why the, would you want to go watch a video now? It's not the right. same, you know, kind of content, right? So it's same and same. So great. But here's after I did some digging, because you know me, man. When I hear a new strategy, or whatever, I gotta, I gotta learn all the things I can about it. Yeah. So I went to this yeah. rabbit hole last night. And here and here's where it gets interesting. So since you've been on, Medium has highly, um, like, significantly changed the way that they help their creators. And so unlike any other platform, Substack included, all these other places where you can post uh, news articles or newsletters or blogs or whatever, is that like the um, creator economy, I guess you could say, is, is super nice there. So for example, if, you, if I sent you my link and said, hey, like if you watch my, uh, my, if you read my article and then signed up, I get half, it's almost half, it's like $2.30 because it's $5 a month there. I'll get two dollars and thirty cents every single month. You're a member. Really? Okay. So obviously that can grow. The other cool thing is you pay five dollars a month, right? And again, I'm gonna I'm paraphrasing, and then the, there's nuance to the numbers. But something like this, where if I pay five dollars a month, right? And let's they take like a dollar forty off that off the top, right? But if I only read in that month like three to five articles, and you're one of those articles, you could make off of me a dollar. 50 cents, two cents, whatever, depending on how long I'm, I'm on your thing for, like you get that money because I was reading your article. Wow. And so that's how like there's individuals that say they've made, like this one woman was posted on YouTube, her story and she started, and granted, it's a little bit different because again, she already had a really strong YouTube following so you could argue some of them went there, but whatever. Um, she made like six grand off of an article. Okay. So here's where it gets interesting though, right? Because there is a strategy to it. Because I know people that have been on the platform, they're like, Ray, I was on there, wasn't making any money. But here's how it works. First and foremost, you have to get to 100 subscribers. That's the first sure. thing, right? So you can cross promote, do what you got to do. But the, the thing is 100 subscribers. There's some people that say that you can just like follow a bunch of people and they'll follow back. I'm trying that actively right now. It's a super like whatever hacky kind of way of getting to 100 subscribers. I'll tell you if it works or not, but whatever. Yeah. At least I'm honest. I'm going to test it out. But the right. first thing that's important is getting to 100 subscribers. Cool. Once you get there, this is everyone just keeps posting and then wondering no one, one, why no one's watching. Once you get to 100, one, you can become a partner, which is how you start making money for your articles. Number two, you're going to find publications. They're almost like clubs. And they think of it like a news article, honestly, or a, a newspaper. Yeah. And they accumulate all these. So then you go, hey, I got this article. I think it might be good for your publication. Now, if they pick it up, and this is where the work comes in, and also where people will probably give up, because you got to send it out to a like you can't just send it out to one and then hope it gets picked up. Like send that sucker out to a few. But if yeah. they get picked up, and like if they get picked up and it goes right on the top of their screen or whatever, that's how you start making money because they have more followers. Well, it's interesting in the case of that woman I was mentioning earlier with six thousand um, subscribe or six thousand dollars she made off an article was because a uh, publication picked it up. But then um, Medium themselves picked it up, and then it went on the the homepage. So then she started making like three hundred dollars a day. So so if I posted on this publication, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's me, like it's connected back to my personal account. So everybody who clicks on it, even though it's on somebody else's publication, gets yeah you that, get money. The credit goes to you. So what about that publication? Are they getting some back end part of it? They, yeah, hundred percent. They're they're definitely getting some money. And again, I'm not really yeah. sure on like the the profit sharing, but again, it's super dope how that kind of works anyway. Because again, in no other place that I know of, right? I know like some of my clients make newsletters on LinkedIn, and I literally told them today, like, hey, I don't have this like this theory built out all the way or this strategy built out the, all the way, but stop posting on LinkedIn. And the reason why is because one. The domain authority for LinkedIn versus Medium. That's number one. Number two is like on LinkedIn, you can have like 3,000 subscribers there. And still, it's a lot like Instagram. And that majority of them aren't going to see it. And here's why, right? Like It's like on LinkedIn, you can post videos. You can post like comments. You can do all this stuff. All this various type of content. So newsletters become very small. Medium is only articles. 
Right. So, so they are going to promote your shit better than like LinkedIn does. The other thing is you cannot make money off you posting on LinkedIn from LinkedIn. LinkedIn's going to keep all, all that right. money. So right. again, for me, it's like, if I'm going to have to su- subscribers, if I'm going to post somewhere, why not make some money? And if we're being super realistic, here's what you could probably expect. Six bucks, $10 a day, you know, something like that on, on, on a medium, but that's not how you're going to make the most of your money. Most of your money is going to come from this. And this is why I'm super excited about it. I'm really big on cross promoting different uh, platforms. Like, as you know, and maybe the audience doesn't, but like, I'm really big on bingeability. And I want you to read something and then spend more time with me. So imagine for you specifically, right. you do your blog post, okay, or your article on Medium. The call to action is P.S., do you want these sent directly to your email? Subscribe here. Or do you want these daily mind shifts? Uh, specifically designed for you and your whatever. Okay. They can go to the, click the link at the bottom and go and sign up to your email list. Now you're building your email list. The other cool thing is you're proposing building like a MailChimp or some other exterior email list from this, from medium. Yes. So it'll go directly to your landing page and they sign up there. The other cool thing is, and this is where it gets interesting, is that now I'm not, I'm leveraging, increasing my email list. I'm leveraging getting more people to see my landing page. And by the way, this could be a free course. I've seen people do that and other things by leveraging their domain authority and their viewership. Because the truth is, Instagram, like for example, you may get, like depending on your, like you specifically, maybe probably see 10, 15, 20 max website clicks. Now, that's because of where you're at in the platform, how many followers you got. But on Medium, again, if another platform, another publication picks it up and they have 20,000 uh, subscribers, right? And let's say 5,000 people see it, 2,000 people see it, that significantly increases the likelihood of them clicking that link. So again, your Anthony.com is not going to have the same domain, domain authority as Medium does. It's just not. Right. Not yet anyway. Right. One day. So anyway, you're going to leverage their viewership because they have 60 million uh, active users, something like that. You're going to leverage them to drive them to your other links, et cetera, where it gets extra, like how I'm using it. I'm going to A-B test this. That's one way. Send them directly to your list, get their email list. The way that I'm also going to use it is I'm embedding video, YouTube videos, you embed YouTube videos because now I can grow that page over there. So again, I'm leveraging them, promoting me there. Cause it's, it's a little bit, it seems to me that it's a little bit easier if you make good enough content to like grow there versus like YouTube, YouTube is very hard to grow on YouTube. Like it takes a long time, not as much as medium. So I can leverage medium to then grow YouTube, which then YouTube can then land to email us, et cetera. So my point is, and the best part for you is that it don't take you any more time. So this is where you and your email, your daily uh, emails take like the best one from the week. The one that you're like, I feel very excited about this. Boom, that's your article. Yeah. Every single one article a week. Every single week. Like you don't have to do it every single day, but you know. But the the reason why they got me on it, because I remember there's a guy, uh, there's a guy named Benjamin Hardy. Yep. And I'm familiar with him. Yeah. So personality is impermanent. Uh, gap in the game. Yeah. That kind of stuff. And I'm like, I know he's a seven figure entrepreneur. Far past it, right? And I'm like, he's not on Instagram really that strong. He, you know, has a decent Twitter account he never looks at. And I'm like, how in the world? Oh, it's because what he was doing. And I remember listening to him talk about this on like uh, this podcast where he was writing for Medium, but, you know, he's getting tons of views, but he didn't have the call to action to go to his email list. And by simply changing that, he increased his email list by thousands. Like I'm, I'm willing to bet that guy probably has 50,000 subscribers and, or to his email list. And that's how he's making all of his money is leveraging medium. So that's what I mean, dude. Like people look at the world, going back to what we're talking about, right? They have this small window of, I gotta make money on Instagram. And there's so many different ways, especially if you're a natural writer like you and you're good at it and it's part of your craft. Let's, even if, again, at the very least, you do it on, you do it once a week on Medium. You get to 100 subscribers, you you partner with them and you go, Raylan, I don't care about backlinks. I don't care about any of that crap. I, you know, whatever. You could make $10, a month, 20 bucks. If it gets picked up, maybe make a couple hundred bucks. That's more money than you're making now on putting right. it up wherever. Yeah. No, anyway, I, what are your thoughts? I, I think <laughs> I love the idea of the leverage to, to be able to 
used the power of that platform. And I do. I remember Benjamin Hardy. In fact, I remember the first time I encountered his work was on media and he was, you know, talking about his process. And I think at that point he was going for his PhD or something. So he was mm-hmm. kind of walking through that process and then reading personalities and permanent. In fact, I'm reading his newest one, your future self now or something like mm-hmm. that. And he arguably built that Hay house, published his book, you know, a very well-known publisher and he built that platform. He built his influence on Medium. So it started all I had there. totally forgotten about that. So, Dude, me too. And again, when I heard Shane tell me about Medium and I was t- telling Kayla, because Kayla knows, you know, knows them and stuff. And I go, oh, my God. I connected the dots. Like I never knew that's what he meant when he was talking about Medium. I've heard him talk in places and whatever. Oh, yeah. And I go, oh, my. that's That was the connection I was missing. And then now this world opened up where I was like, okay, but now here it gets even deeper. And there's the last thing, and then we probably got to oh, cut this off another, because there's another level. <laughs> well, because like you know, this is like Let's it, go. hopefully people are actually listening. To the like, do this strategy. So again, now imagine you take for you, again part of that your best of the week, right? Or or in your daily emails, you then take a portion of that, like you fill in some blanks, and then you have the Twitter, and the Twitter goes to the blog. The Twitter thread goes to the blog. So now you're growing your Twitter. And then back to Medium. The most interesting part of Medium is that the co-founder of Twitter is the founder of Medium. Yeah. So they super like, – like they love Twitter. That's one of the only things you can connect, that and Facebook, to Medium. So, again, it could grow your Twitter account. So it's all about, like again, leveraging these different platforms and using them. Because here's, here's the part that nobody talks about right now. Uh, actually, a lot of people are talking about it right now. Is you're over, People are overly dependent on, on platforms. But here's the problem is that TikTok is under investigation to be banned from the U.S. I know people oh, right. right now. Yeah, they're like seriously considering it because it, like we didn't know that China was like using it to spy on all of us. Like we, we knew. Come right. on. Yeah. Like, you like we don't care. Like they're twerking. Let's bro, go. Like first of all, first of all, how about this? In China, you go and use TikTok. It's only like engineering books it's literally you can't there's nothing funny it's only because yeah. they're i mean obviously it's china right so they restrict what everyone right. sees but it's right. only you can only see that to improve your life and then over in america they're like no education Whatever. just right. let them twerk yeah. like this <laughs> twerking only right so anyway right. that twerk might get banned. only and i know people right now that are like railing tiktok's the only way to grow your business and i'm like okay but what if tiktok says fuck you yeah, then what? Like you got like come on. Like yeah. the the problem is and this is like this I promise I'll tie it back to what we're talking about. And then we're going to finish That's the good. episode. Is is this? This is we started this thing with like personal and 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 financial freedom. That's really what we're talking about here. And if we yeah. really want true personal and financial freedom, you cannot be tied to an Instagram a Facebook, like if all of your money comes from one platform, you're doing it wrong. Cause all it has to do, cause I know people that literally lost like tens of thousands of dollars when in- Instagram changed the algorithm. Every time they change, Yo. they lose a bunch of money because no one's seeing their stuff and whatever versus, you know, people like you and I, cause I'm, I'm trying to get you to, you know, make some money some other place. If Instagram, like Instagram put me in a box recently, I don't know what happened, but they like, they don't share my stuff. Like I don't get reach. <laughs> Like at all. I just don't. They're like, fuck this guy. And guess what? I don't care because I don't even make my money there anymore. I don't yeah. care. And it's like that's what personal freedom is about. So, again, to tie this all back and to, to end on a non railing rant, I want us to finish with this. Let's talk about stillness for a second now that I just wanted Ooh. this crazy, chaos, chaotic rant. Love it. We have Love a it. billion things to do as business owners. We got to learn this. We got to learn. We got to do this. We got to do this. Uh, in order to be better as a human being, we gotta read this book. We gotta do this. We gotta we gotta meditate more. We gotta stretch more. We gotta work out more. How can we find stillness? One, what is the purpose of stillness? Like, why even uh, try to get stillness today? And then finally, how can we find it in a world full of chaos? And I want to throw something at you before I let you go. Is is I have this uh, uh, client of mine who is probably one of the most fascinating people I know, and she goes. I asked this question to her, and I want to hear your, you know, see how different it is. So she's like an energy worker. And she goes, I want you to okay. imagine our tornado, how it's just spinning. And she goes, people will sit in, in the, like, fight against the wind of the tornado, 
Instead, lean into the tornado until you get the eye of the storm. Mm. And that's where everything is still in chaos. Again, I'm not going to lie. Tactically, no idea what she was talking about, but boy, did it sound good. <laughs> <laughs> like, t- I'm not going near a tornado, but I, I hear you. I feel you. I think the idea, especially from an entrepreneurial standpoint and somebody who's trying to build something significant, somebody's trying to show up in a way that has an impact, right? So in order to do that, you're not going to haphazardly, you're not, you might, you might stumble your way there in the, in the sense of you're going to fail your way forward. There's definitely that component, but you're not going to just like armchair your way there, wake up in, in success, right? So there's a work ethic. There's a, there's a mentality shift that has to happen. You have to be willing to show up when you don't feel like showing up, when things get hard, when you want to bail, when everybody says this is stupid, you should give up on this, whatever it is, right? The, the bills are coming in, you're not sure what to do. All that stuff is going to be a component of building something of significance. There's no question about it. And so there's this, what's easy in what people have coined hustle culture to work, 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 and then need to rest. And then get back at it. I try to flip this around and this I would tie back to where we began too. like there's something within the spiritual traditions, all the spiritual traditions, whether you're coming from the Judeo Christian, whether you're coming from Buddhists, whether you come, whatever it is, there's there's a, an emphasis on intentional rest or what you called stillness, uh, what some would call Sabbath. And it's not work, 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 so then you can rest. It's rest so that you can work. It's to work from a place of rest. So sometimes rest is a difficult thing to do, depending on how you're wired, depending on if you've got like this grind in you, this drive in you. Rest is not a lazy thing. Rest becomes something that you have to almost calendar for some people. You have to make it a part of your practice to say that I am going to willfully withdraw myself from other obligations so that I can recalibrate myself, so that I can listen to the silence. One of the things that most humans do, regardless of if you're trying to build something of significance or not, is we we don't know we're doing this necessarily, but we fill our lives with chaos and noise so that we don't have to hear what comes through in the stillness. But that's where the insights are. That's where you start to find your limiting beliefs. That's where you start to find the things that are holding you back. That's where you start to find those pain points and the the fear. And that's where you start to, to recognize, I need to have an uncomfortable conversation with this person because what's going on in the dynamic of this relationship is setting me back. This is a there's a ball of stress in my stomach for instance just do this and even if you don't actually physically do this think about this or do this maybe when you do find a place of quiet get really still slow your breathing hands on your lap whatever it is you will notice that you're holding tension somewhere in your body for some people it'll be their neck for some people it'll be their jaw You wouldn't know it with the noise and the moving around and the doing stuff that you're doing. But if you get quiet enough, you get still enough and you slow down intentionally enough, you're like, whoa, my jaw is clenched. Whoa, my brow is furrowed. Uh, There's there's a tension in my hands. There's tension in my legs. When you get still enough, you realize that you're straining in ways that you didn't even know you were doing. That's physically But it's also metaphorically true about the way we show up with our emotions and our mental state. And so if you want to have longevity, if you want the work that you're doing to be sustainable, you have to build a a, a stillness practice in your life. That's where the longevity comes from because you're recognizing, man, if I continue on this track, I'm going to crash into a wall. If I don't have this conversation, this relationship is going to implode. If I don't offload this thing that I'm doing that's not actually helping move the needle, it's holding it back. If I don't cut ties with this relationship, if I don't stop doing this, if I don't pull back on some of this stuff, I'm not going to be able to get to where I go. And you're not going to be able to do that with the noise. I wrote about this the other day, but I think it applies here. It's like when you're driving somewhere that you haven't been before 
and you're using the GPS or you, you know the address and you're listening to music on the drive, right? And it's this casual experience. You're driving around listening to music. You got it turned up. What do you do when you're looking for an address when you're listening to music? Turn down. You turn, you turn the music down. Is that going to help you see better all of a sudden? Like you can't see an address because the volume is too? No. There's so much chaos going on that our cognitive abilities, our, our mental faculties are so overloaded that turning it down takes one level of stimulus away so that we can focus our attention on something that we need to do. In this case, find where we're going. How is that not a metaphor for how we show up in the world? If we... If we're struggling with where do I go next with my business? Where do I go next in this relationship? How, what's the next chapter for me? Maybe turn down the music. And if you get still enough, man, that answer has been there the whole time. The address is right here. My next turn is right in front of me. And I almost missed it. That's the benefit. And that's the essential quality of stillness. Beautifully said. That's why I always... When I ask you questions, I'll let you take it because you make it sound so much better. But like the, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think one of the things that I've been discovering and, and being obsessed with lately, and this is partly why I wanted you on the podcast, was was the idea of stillness. Like I've been – there's this weird – and I think, first of all, you know, Anthony, you, you definitely are going to have to come back to the podcast, obviously. Let's go. Um, yeah. Because I've been battling for what feels like years – this idea between work and surrender, like the dichotomy of the two. And what's been super fascinating is that stillness for me in the morning. Like I have blocked out of my time where I come upstairs in my office and I either read or I write or I do my thing and I'm by myself. No noise, no lo-fi hip-hop, even though I love it. None of that, just silence um, is, is how I usually find the weird strategies and, and things that are in my head. And so I think stillness is one of those things that in this culture of go, 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 more and more do we do we need today. But also, you know, again, it's it's one of those things that's also hard to tell somebody, especially like I'm finding an entrepreneurship is like, and you've heard me say this to clients, but it's like, yeah, yeah, you just gotta suffer a little bit more. Like just keep keep going. Like there yeah. you don't have to work hard. It's just working consistently. And I think the only way that I could verbalize it today, and maybe I'll get better over time, is just do the work, do it well, and then you let go. And Anthony, I think more than anybody that I know right now, you are amazing at doing the work, doing it well, and then letting go. So with that being said, Anthony, I appreciate you for being on, man. Appreciate this, man. It's been an awesome conversation. So let's get the next one scheduled. No, for sure.